Thanks very much, Scott, for that terrific introduction, some of which is true. And uh, uh, now, this is the real thing. Never mind anything that happened before, okay? <laughs> So this Nautilus magazine was quite an experience. Um, it's an ambitious magazine, uh, a science magazine, only a few years old. They won't let you see the article before it appears, but they do have a fact checker on the phone with you uh, to go over and make sure there are no serious errors. But one thing they will not do, absolutely an absolute rule over there, is they will not tell you anything about the title. And even the interviewer doesn't have any idea what the uh, title of the article is going to be. That's last minute decided in a different department. <laughs> so I said, well, to my interviewer, I said, there must be some super experts there on titles. <laughs> so <laughs> I was horrified, absolutely horrified, uh, when uh, I found out that the title was, This Man is About to Blow Up Mathematics. <laughs> Um, now, I actually really, I was worried that I was going to get a visit from the FBI, or, or worse. And uh, uh, that was a problem. And I also worried, you know, what is Scott going to, you know, say to me? I hear I have the, I come here and the visit is canceled. You know, and, uh, I mean, this was a, this was a, a concern. Uh, but I'm going to reassure you, if we all stay cool, we shouldn't have any violence here. I, okay, they, we shouldn't really have any. So let's see how it goes. Now, actually, there are three titles floating around. <laughs> this man is about to blow up mathematics. That's the actual title. Harvey Friedman is about to bring incompleteness and infinity out of quarantine. And that's the actual official subtitle. And then there's the man who wants to rescue infinity, which turns out to be uh, 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 the tech title, the uh, the, uh, uh, the link, you know, uh, to, uh, to the article. Somehow, you know, I mean, this probably was left by accident. So there's this. This is probably the title they were thinking of using, and at the last minute, they decided nobody was going to read the article, so they might as well have it. Blow up mathematics would have a better readership. <laughs> uh, now I don't know about you, but actually, I thought that the second of these titles. Uh, it would be the best, and uh, in fact, bring in completeness and bring infinity out of quarantine. I think uh, you know, uh, if you're going to go with this kind of title, I think would have been a little bit less uh, dangerous. All right. So incompleteness, in a general sense, uh, started long before the late great great Kurt Gödel. Um, in, in, uh, in a general sense, uh, let's look at the ordered field axioms. Uh, th this is the high school stuff that you would write down, or elementary school stuff that you'd write down with plus, minus, times, reciprocal. Uh, these, uh, the, the ordered field axioms, very, uh, very easy for you to take your phone out, which I hope you don't do, and type in ordered field axioms, and you would see the axioms. All right, maybe I do hope you. Uh, uh, all right, but anyways. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so this statement is, there is a B such that B times B is 2. Okay, this is one form nice formulation. Now, it's actually uh, uh, better known as the square root of 2 exists. This is uh, a more common way to talk about it. And uh, we know from about 2,400 years ago that there's no rational square root of 2. And uh, we conclude in modern terms that the above statement is neither provable nor refutable in OFA. Now, I don't think the Pythagoreans were talking about provables and refutables and OFA, of course, but this is how we can talk about it now. Uh, now, why is this the case? Uh, uh, we have a model of, of OFA, uh, order field axioms. We have a model in which the statement is true, and we also have a model in which the statement is false. Uh, and the model in which it's, it's uh, uh, true is the ordered field of real numbers, or if you you know if you're a mathematician, you know that there's a lot smaller fields. You know the these Pythagorean fields, or you can take the real algebraic numbers, and you know various things you can do. Um, but the ordered field of real numbers as we know it, uh, and a mo and there's also a model which is false, the usual ordered field of rationals. That's where the statement is false. Now let's fast forward to uh, modern times, uh, and we know how to fix this incompleteness. We can fix this incompleteness. To fix it means there's no more incompleteness. 
In other words, everything is provable or refutable. We know how to fix it. There's two very well-known ways. One is we can fix it algebraically. We can fix it algebraically by asserting, first of all, that positives have square roots. And we, can also, and we also have to have something else. That, that would just give us these Pythagorean fields. Uh, 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 namely, that every polynomial of odd degree in one variable has a root. Okay? And uh, we can also fix it logically uh, by taking the least upper bound principle for all first order formulas. Least upper bound for all first order formulas. But then, of course, the second I call logically, because if you don't know what a first order formula is, you have a problem understanding number two. Um, so uh, now, both of these both of these ways of fixing OFA uh, require inf infinitely many axioms, because uh, of, uh, number one does because we have to say this polynomial of odd degree thing. We have to say this in each odd uh, degree, so you're stuck doing that. And then in the logical one, uh, the, uh, the, there's infinitely many first order formulas. And there's a theorem that uh, you must, uh, this is unavoidable, OK? Uh, and they're logically equivalent. One and two, by the way, are logically equivalent. And that's not at all obvious. That's quite interesting. And, um, uh, and, and actually goes back to, um, well, it goes back to Tarski and then earlier uh, things, uh, uh, earlier things of algebraists. But basically, Tarski is an important figure in this. Uh, they entirely stamp out the incompleteness. The resulting uh, systems prove or refute all statements uh, in in its language. Okay, all statements in the language of ordered field. Uh, now, also by the way, the axiom the, the uh, axiom instances. In, K, in one and two, are easily algorithmically recognized. I mean, you can tell whether you've uh, written down a polynomial of odd degree in one variable has a root. Whether you've written down an instance of that, you can tell whether you've written down a least upper bound uh, prin uh, principle for a particular uh, first order formula. That's easy to recognize. Okay, so we have all that. This is a nice story. The only the only blemish on this story, and you know, you know, it's a, you can argue it's not a blemish at all is that it requires infinitely many axioms to fix it. Now, there are similar developments in elementary geometry rather than elementary algebra, with a particularly famous example, the parallel postulate in Euclidean geometry. These are all also fixable, by the way. And in many cases, geometry has a much stronger kind of fixable incompleteness, uh, what I call second-order incompleteness. A uh, relationship between first and second order incompleteness is worthy of several talks, mathematical and philosophical. But uh, we're focusing on first order incompleteness here. And you have to talk about first order incompleteness if you want to get down to issues about actually having proofs. Okay, so, so this, is, this is the uh, uh, early story. Now, let's consider uh, something a little different. The discrete ordered ring axioms, or DORA. Okay, DORA, nice uh, name. Dora, um, is very much like uh, OFA. <laughs> it sounds nicer. Except that we only think of integers. There's no reciprocal order division. We don't use any reciprocal order division. And this is also an elementary school thing with 0, 1, plus, minus, times, and less than. And instead of anything about reciprocal order division, we have, um, we add Nothing is strictly between 0 and 1. In, uh, uh, that's what we have. And now we consider the following basic statement. Uh, for all b, there exists c such that c plus c is b or c plus c is b plus 1, better known as every number is either even or odd. OK, so uh, this statement is independent of Dora. It's true in the ordered ring of integers and false in the ordered polynomial ring in one variable over the integer. So you do have to bring in some algebraic ideas to see what's going on here. All right, now let's use the logical approach number two. Remember number two was, number two was, um, um, I'm sorry, I'm going the wrong way. Number two was um, there. Logically, the least upper bound principle for all first order formulas. Okay, that worked wonders in OFA. When it was, it, it fixed the incompleteness theorem completely. 
But now what we do here is we want to add to Dora and try to use the same trick, the least upper bound principle for all first order formulas. Now, actually, you get a system that's very, very, very powerful. It's very strong. Uh, but Gödel showed that it's not strong enough for completeness. So Dora plus two star still has incompleteness. Could you say what is the least upper bound principle? An upper bound that's least. Yeah. <laughs> so the statement of the principle for every sequence of. Uh, no, 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 no. Statement is if you have a formula, yeah. first order formula, and it holds of something, mm -hmm. then it holds of a least thing. And that's an exact analogy with the with the one for the uh, for for OFA, except it's not the least thing; it's uh, the least upper bound. Okay, all right. But you can also state this as least upper bound in both cases. You can state it uniformly. Yeah. Okay. Now, in fact, there's no way to add further axioms to appropriately fix this incompleteness. This incompleteness is not fixable uh, uh, at all. Uh, Okay, so Dora plus two star is essentially a rewrite of what is normally called piano arithmetic or PA. And it is well known that PA is essentially equivalent to, there's another way to talk about PA, which is probably even uh, more uh, memorable, uh, might be more memorable to you, more obvious to you, namely finite set theory. You can imagine a thing called finite set theory where, where all the sets are finite and you can do the usual things you can do with finite sets that you would imagine. Uh, and uh, uh, count them, for example. Or, or there are various, there are many formulations of finite set theory that are all more or less equivalent. And, and piano arithmetic and finite set theory are known to be essentially the same, okay? Um, so FST may be enough already to prove or refute all finitary mathematical statements that have, as of March 1st, 2017, been published in accepted mathematical venues by mathematicians operating as mathematicians, as opposed to acting as FOM provocateurs like me. Okay. Say FOM. Uh, foundations of mathematics. FOM means foundations of mathematics. Uh, so uh, that's now become a good technical term, sort of standardized. Um, and uh, capital F, capital O, capital M with no periods is the email list. Foundations of math is, a, is, a, is an automated email list, uh, uh, a uh, uh, moderated, mo not automated, moderated email list. All right, so um, so FST might be enough to prove or refute all finitary mathematical statements that have, as of March first, twenty seventeen, been published in accepted mathematical venues by mathematicians operating as mathematicians as opposed to uh, uh, acting as FOM provocateurs, okay? And that would be a kind, if that was the case, we would have a kind of completeness, kind of what might be called practical completeness. Practical completeness, okay? And it's the possibility or idea of practical incompleteness that uh, tends to get mathematicians in a state of uh, of, uh, of uh, overconfidence that this is not going to, uh, this whole business is not going to bother them. Yes? Okay, uh, uh, let, me uh, let me just take, uh, all right, it, it depends upon uh, uh, when I'm talking to you, uh, uh, you know, but, but right now this means a finitary mathematical statement, take this to mean a statement in which all the objects being referred to are finite. It could refer to, uh, Let's, so let's consider Fermat's last theorem. All the objects being referred to are finite, uh, but there are infinitely many objects being referred to. Okay, so we should make that distinction. But if I have a statement involving uh, real numbers and continuous functions on the real line, then uh, by no means I uh, is it the case that it's finite Okay? All right. Now, it's widely believed that Fermat's last theorem is provable in finite set theory, although this has not yet been firmly established. This has not yet been firmly established. Uh, there's some uh, work on this if you want to look it up. Look up the names on, on, on the Internet. Um, uh, let me uh, just see. Uh, 
Angus McIntyre, but it might, might have find it hard to find that one as, as good as the one that I'm forgetting. Um, just a second. Uh, I'll come back. I'll think of it. Uh, if you're interested in that, uh, write me. Or you can actually uh, also, I'm sure you would get the, the, the McClarty, M-C-L-A-R-T-Y, M-C-L-A-R-T-Y, colon, C-O-L-I-N. Uh, wrote uh, somewhat extensively on this issue of what does it take to prove Fermat's last theorem? What is it? Well, it takes some smarts, we know that, but, <laughs> but, but, but logically, so to speak, uh, uh, what, what, what does it take? And um, uh, uh, so from that, you can get the state of the art uh, story on it. Um, now, this leaves open the possibility that FOM investigators may be able to discover a finitary statement that is independent of finite set theory, fully compatible with normal mathematical culture. Um, there isn't a clock, actually, I'm instantly visible here. You've got 20 minutes, so 15 minutes. I've used? Yeah, you've used. Okay. I'm gonna, Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. My yeah, my eyes are not that good. Okay, oh I see it, 4:22. Okay, good. I wish it was uh, twice as big. This is Texas. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, this, discover a finitary statement that is independent of FST, fully compatible with normal mathematical culture, and argue that the statement, although introduced by an FOM provocateur is inevitable over the realistically far out future of math. Maybe going out 7,500 years or something, right? Okay, note how such inevitability would answer objections that a provocateur was involved. Okay? This is really the heart of the matter, right here. Okay, this is, or a heart of the matter, right here. Okay, inevitability, provocateurs, and time, <laughs> all right? Actually, we have a growing body of steadily more convincing examples of what I call concrete mathematical incompleteness. The early examples of such concrete mathematical incompleteness at the FST level, we're talking about the FST level. We're not talking about the big time stuff that come later in this talk. So, so stay here, stay, don't go anywhere, all right? Early examples of such concrete mathematical completeness at the FST level are Goodstein's theorem, paris harrington theorem, and Hydra games. Okay, you can go have fun uh, uh, looking those things up. And there are some later examples at the FST level that are arguably more aligned with ordinary mathematical culture. Now, one could, I could go on for quite a while about what, I, what on earth do I mean by ordinary mathematical culture, but then I wouldn't have any time to talk about anything else. So let me just continue the way I am, okay? All right. My current favorites at the FST or PA level are at uh, number 747. Uh, that's, that's an index of my, my uh, misses on the FOM email list, okay? Incompleteness 2. February 3rd, 2017, on the FOM archives. You can get to the FOM archives uh, and, and look these things up. Um, uh, and this is what it, it, it says. Let's, go, let's do this. Uh, so there's, I want to introduce two relations between vectors of natural numbers. The first relation is adjacency. Uh, you don't have to read anything. Just go to the example. Three five eight is adjacent to five eight nine. Right? You know what? Now you know what I mean. In other words, I've just knocked off the front, put something in the back, and they were all strictly incre and the two of them were strictly increasing. All right? And then uh, less than or equals c means coordinate wise less than or equals. So two four seven and two five eight. That that means that you're lifting something, we in a weak sense where you're a lot of qualities. These are nice, these are two very important relations on vectors, and uh, obviously adjacent implies less than or equal to C. And the interaction between these two binary relations, the interaction between these two, all hell breaks loose, okay, uh, is quite interesting. And by the way, there's a general subject here which I have not started to think about, uh, except thinking about thinking about it, 
and that is uh, if I take two uh, what's called order invariant relations, if I take two simple relations, uh, uh, what is the interaction between them in general? But I'm just going to, I just, I've just looked at these two. Okay, the most fundamental one, easiest one to state that is, but the least, the least finitary one. <laughs> okay, but the most uh, easy one to state is this. If I have a function from n to the k into n to the k, where n is the non-negative integers, then there's some x, le uh, there's some x adjacent to y such that f of x goes, uh, lifts to f of y. Okay? And this is the theorem. And uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, in a sense, transcends uh, a finite set theories and extensions thereof uh, uh, that are purely uh, language oriented. Okay, it's a little complicated what I'm saying. But the point is adjacent lifting, you know it when you've proved it that you've done something bizarre. Okay? All right. Recursive adjacent lifting is an attempt to remove the bizarreness of this by simply insisting that the original function be recursive in the sense of, uh, compu of algorithms. Okay? Uh, and uh, this uh, is a good attempt. It's always nice to, to try to do this kind of thing. And then the statement is purely finitary, because now there are no infinite objects involved, because, the, uh, because you don't have to talk about the actual function. You talk about the rule, you know, the Turing machine. OK, now this statement actually is independent of piano arithmetic, flat out. All right? Now, if you're a computer scientist, there are too many recursive functions. So why not, why not elementary recursive functions, if you know what they are? It means uh, uh, that's a bound on the amount of, of, compu of that's a time complexity bound. Uh, and, and then you can do this, and then it turns out that's also independent of piano arithmetic. Now, there's a whole theory here. How low can I go? Uh, uh, how, how low can I go into real time, even real time algorithms? And I have not really looked into this. But, uh, but the general feeling is that unless you go all the way down to um, a finite state automata, you're pretty much stuck with it being independent of PA, although that's not been actually worked out. All right. Now, somebody might say, okay, you're a mathematician in the audience, not a computer scientist, not a logician. And you say, yeah, but uh, these are still too many functions. I don't fool around with this kind of function. And I don't care about Turing machines. I've always hated that anyways. So how about polynomials? It's a little bit hard to hide from polynomials. Uh, within, and these, and we're, in, we're in the integers here, so we're talking about polynomials with, um, you know, with integer coefficients, OK? And you can chunk, you can, you can do, so look at the polynomials from n to the k into n to the k. Their natural domain, of course, will be z to the k. Uh, and, uh, and now we reverse it. We have some x. And, and we have to assume that the polynomial is surjective, otherwise this won't make much sense. Uh, so we have so a, a surjective polynomial, then, it has, then there's some x that lifts to y, where p of x is adjacent to p of y. Okay? And this is a closely related statement. Now this statement is also independent of piano arithmetic. Right? Okay, so that I regard this as a state of the art, because I like the person who actually did this. All right. Okay. Usually like. Uh, all four of these statements can only be proved by going slightly beyond finite set theory or piano arithmetic or ACA naught for those, for those experts in logic here, of which I see none, by the way. Um, <laughs> they can only be proved by using some seriously noticeable use of infinitistic methods that clearly go beyond the statements themselves. In other words, you will know that you did something when you proved this because uh, it just looks... Um, uh, you know, kind of, kind of much more infinitistic than it ought to be. All right, uh, this represents demonstrably necessary use of machinery. Demonstrably necessary use of machinery. Mathematicians love uses of machinery for state, uh, particularly for statements that don't have the machinery uh, uh, in your face. They love it, but they don't generally uh, have any proof that the machinery is necessary, and, and of course, it's usually not necessary, although it might be much uglier if you didn't use it, and also less impressive because machines are impressive. But 
Here we're talking about demonstrable necessary uses of machinery, where you actually prove that the machinery cannot be eliminated. And this is a theme throughout all this work that I'm talking about, especially when it gets really powerful. This is the uh, silly little, tiny little part of the talk. It gets much, 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 much worse. Okay. All right. Now, uh, okay. So, because, look, to prove these statements, it's sufficient to use a tiny, 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 tiny fragment of the usual ZFC actions for mathematics. Because we're really talking, you know, close to the level of finite mathematics, okay? Just maybe just at the, at the outer fringe. By the way, uh, I have, there is a uh, book draft. Uh, 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 you can look up Boolean relation theory, Harvey Friedman. You probably get it. Get it. Uh, I think that's better than trying to copy the exact URL, right? Uh, uh, you can get this, uh, and there's a there's an introduction that's 250 pages, which talks about the history of concrete and in, uh, mathematical incompleteness, uh, uh, and uh, this covers. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the story from below the finite set theory realm uh, to around the uncountable, uncountable cardinality round, uh, uh, level, which I'm going to talk about in a moment, uh, a very substantial fragment. And then it also talks about uh, uh, Boolean relation theory. Boolean relation theory, or BRT, is a predecessor theory of emulation theory. Emulation theory is more cool. Emulation theory causes crazy people to talk about blowing up mathematics. Uh, Boolean relation theory, I did this Boolean relation theory. I, nobody ever said I was going to blow up mathematics. Now, emulation theory, they, somebody said I was. So you see, so it must be better. All right. So um, all four of these statements that I uh, told you, yeah, I already said that. What happened here? I went the wrong way. Yeah. OK. Um, now, uh, let me state, in all existing cases of concrete mathematical incompleteness, we have the following uh, phenomena. The, the statement is shown over a pre pro appropriate weak base theory, a uh, uh, non-problematic base. Uh, the statement is shown to be outright equivalent to the consistency of, uh, of an unexpectedly strong system, a formal system from logic. It's show, the, the statement is shown to be equivalent to the consistency of piano arithmetic or the consistency of finite set theory, or maybe a little, there's a variant of consistency called one consistency, whatever, never mind the, the technicalities. Uh, and, uh, and for stronger examples, it might be more, you know. Uh, the statement is shown to be equivalent to the consistency. So here we have innocent looking mathematical statements like this, which are shown to be equivalent to the formal consistency of some sort of. Uh, of uh, uh, system of axioms for mathematics. Okay, we have that equivalence. Uh, now, assuming that the that the theory is okay, whatever that means, this establishes the independence of the statement from the theory. This establishes it. First of all, if P is refutable from the theory, then T proves its own inconsistency. You know, following this this line. By the way, anything you don't quite understand because it's going back by too fast, which is going to get get happen more frequently as the talk goes into its second phase. Uh, th this will be on the uh, internet next week, uh, you know, and you can just look. And then I actually lightly edited for, for, uh, 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 for some extra information and references. So don't, don't worry about it. Uh, if P is refutable from T, then T proves its own inconsistency. Uh, so T is certainly not, not OK. <laughs> All right? And if P is provable from T, then T proves its own consistency. And by Gödel, T is inconsistent. Gödel proved that if a system proves its own in, in, a consistency, then it must, uh, 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 by default, be inconsistent. Uh, and so the T is definitely not okay. So this is the, this is this is actually the the story of how this stuff is done. It doesn't quite tell you all the details, though. All right. So before diving into emulation theory, which is the latest rage, which might actually we're trying to make sure that it doesn't blow up this room. Uh, I want to I mention a few more results in concrete mathematical incompleteness, ones that don't really challenge ZFC, but nonetheless represent a wide range of important levels of incompleteness. And the kinds of mathematics involved is varied. And it may even threaten to touch your own mathematical interests. I would certainly like to hear about that. Okay. 
in any long enough sequence of of uh, in any long enough sequence from three letter from a three letter alphabet in any long enough sequence from a three letter alphabet some block xi through x2i is a subsequence of some longer block xj through x2j notice uh, Notice the subscripts i and 2i, because that makes the length i plus 1, by the way. Uh, and notice the, uh, the subscripts j and 2j, that makes the length j plus 1. Okay? This is a nice, succinct way of saying it. And also, more generally, in any long enough sequence, x1 through xn from a k-letter alphabet, uh, some xi through x2i is a subsequence of some longer xj through x2j. Same thing except that we uh, let the alphabet be arbitrary, finite alphabet. OK, now the second statement is provable in three-quantifier induction. That means in piano arithmetic with induction for uh, three-quantifier statements, generally more, most seriously of the alternate naming quantifiers, OK? Uh, but not in two-quantifier induction. The, the, the size for the first one, now the first statement is, is ultra-finite, because it, it's totally bounded. Uh, uh, the size for the first statement, the size, meaning the how long does it have to be, the size for the first statement is bigger than the 7,198th Ackerman function at 158,386. Um, I'm not claiming that's best possible. That isn't best possible. It's not. You, you mean n has to be at least that? Yes, yes. That's right. n has to be at least that big for that statement to hold. Um, and I want to give you an idea that that's actually a pretty big number. <laughs> okay. Um, now, any proof of the first in the, any proof of the first statement in a very powerful system, but much weaker than piano arithmetic, exponential function arithmetic, uh, is is a very important system. Of, I know it is because I invented it. But the the point is that this this system, this system of, uh, is very powerful uh, normally. Uh, any proof of the first in, in uh, you would notice if you prove anything uh, uh, that do, it would, that's not an X, an EFA, uh, that's not an EFA that's finite, uh, that's about the natural numbers. If you do that, then you'll notice it. Okay, you'll notice you did something really weird. Um, but any proof of the first statement in EFA out, uh, in EFA needs at least seven, the the seven thousand one hundred ninety eighth Ackerman function at one hundred fifty eight thousand three hundred eighty five. Notice the five is six has been changed to five. Okay, all right. And uh, this is a bit much for a proof. Uh, you know, most people don't really have a, a, even people who publish a lot don't really can't really publish have a trouble with this. Uh, and the same thing is true for CIFA. Now the experts in logic, I don't see anybody, but uh, uh, CIFA is super exponential function arithmetic. Uh, in other words, instead of just a simple exponential, you have an iterated exponential. Um, uh, now, this is kind of like an ultra-finite incompleteness, really ultra-finite incompleteness. You know, you ask for just the one single number, and you say you can't even prove that it exists unless you do something bizarre. Okay, so that's uh, my first thing. Um, what does that say? 439, right? Okay, I better get going here. Uh, no, I'm not going to leave the room, but I'm going to stay here. You, why not? <laughs> you know, is it Texas a big? You know, it's big. It is. Okay. All right. In every infinite sequ in every infinite sequence of finite trees, some tree is homomorphically embeddable in a later tree, and in every infinite sequence of finite graphs, some graph is minor included in a later graph. Uh, now, uh, finite trees, if you draw them in the plane, have a natural topology induced from the from the, as a substrate a subspace from the from the plane, but there are uh, much more combinatorial ways to say that, okay? And this notion of homomorphically embedding is important. Uh, first requires, the first one requires construction of a sequence of integers using all sequences of integers as the base, uh, as your, as your uh, database, <laughs> okay? All right? And the second requires infinite iteration of the first, of, 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 the, of that. The second is even stronger. Such reconstructions were categorically and a priori rejected by Poincaré and Weil as unnecessary, circular, and useless. In other words, they had no idea that you could actually do anything with them. Um, and, and it goes under the name of impredicativity, and you can find these, uh, these uh, diatribes. Uh, today, they're widely accepted as they lie well within CFC. 
Now, the same is true for even very computable sequences. So if I replace infinite sequence here, in both cases, by recursive or elementary recursive, or even probably real-time computable, you have to be a little bit careful, that has not been sort of properly investigated, uh, that it doesn't help you at all. Okay? So it's not a matter of the, of the fact that you're talking about all infinite sequences. It's much more subtle. Okay? Next, for any two countable sets of real numbers, to, for any two countable sets of real numbers, there is a 1, 1 pointwise continuous function from one into the other, either from the first into the second or the second into the first, or possibly both, of course, you know, but, uh, but okay, just what I said. Now, the proof of this, now this sounds like an innocent statement that you might prove uh, uh, using uh, a simple real analysis, freshman calculus uh, done rigorously, where you just look at the uh, count of two countable sets of real numbers and you just sort of inductively construct carefully the one one the one one corresponds from one into the other by just looking at inequalities. Right? I mean, this this would be as uh, sort of you know you'd expect, but this is not the case. You can't do that. The, uh, any proof requires a transfine induction of length omega-1, the first uncountable ordinal, similar to Cantor's transfinite decomposition of closed sets of real numbers. Uh, the statement is not Borelian true, or it's Borel true. There's no Borel function taking two countable sets of reals as infinite sequences and returning such a function, uh, again, as an infinite sequence. No Borel function taking two countable sets of reals and returning an indication of a function for the pointwise continuous function. In other words, there's no indicator function either. That's Borel. Now, if it's not going to be Borel, it's going to be bizarre. So you have to learn, learn that Borel in practice is bizarre. I mean, excuse me, non-Borel in practice is bizarre. Next, if I have a Borel function from the Hilbert cube into itself, in other words, I is the closed unit interval, uh, invariant under permutations. By the way, there's many different senses of invariant under permutations. I don't want to get into them all. But, you know, uh, uh, group actions, you know, the actions and so forth. Symmetric group, finite acting, okay, blah, blah, blah. There's about, and then you could do it on the domain only in the domain and the range, you know. So there's all these things. Uh, maps some sequence to a subsequence. So every invariant Borel function maps some, sequ some, some sequence into a subsequence. And another one in one dimension, though, is every shift invariant Borel function from the Cantor set, which is the infinite sequence of zeros and ones, the Cantor set into itself maps some x to x1, x to the 4, x4, four, x9, x16, dot, dot, dot. Uh, well, the shift, okay, so the shift operator on Cantor set says knock off the first term, simply knock off the first term. Uh, and this is this, is this uh, uh, index squaring operation uh, uh, where you uh, throw away information, okay? Both of these things are exotic. They can't be proved in countable mathematics. They require an uncountable uh, 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 set. And I, I make some remarks about how you, how, what you need to prove this, non-separable spaces and so forth. But I'm running, I, you know, I want to be careful about time budget, uh, so I won't get into that. But there's a thing called separable mathematics, and you can't do it in separable mathematics. You'd expect that you could do this, but you can't. Okay. Uh, finally, every Borel set in the square, in the Euclidean plane, symmetric around the line y equals x, contains or is disjoint from the graph of a Borel function from the reals into the reals. The graph of a Borel function, the graph of a function from reals into reals is a subset of R squared. Um, this statement requires uncountably many uncountable cardinalities. Uncountably many, not only uncountable cardinalities, but uncountably many uncountable cardinalities. Uh, and that's quite a strong fragment of ZFC. An essentially equivalent formulation, uh, proof requires uncountably many transfinite iterations of the power set operation. So if you think of set theory in the, in, in, you know, in the more uh, abstract set theoretic mode, that's what this means. All right. Now I'm, let's jump to emulation theory, which, is a, which is, was the thing that was threatening to have the FBI come. Okay. According to Norlis Magazine, Right? Whoops, I shouldn't have said that. Okay, let me forget I said that. We don't want to keep talking about blowing up things. All right, so the emulation themes goes like this. For any object of a certain kind, 
Some maximal emulation of the same kind exhibits specified symmetry. So S is an emulation of E if it resembles it in a specific way. Okay, now I'm going to get precise, but I want to keep your attention before I get into uh, anything precise. A maximal emulation is an emulation which, if enlarged, stops being an emulation. Symmetry typically requires invariance under transformations. Symmetry means invariance under transformations, if and only if. X is in the set if and only if the transformation of it is, is in the set. So we have this general emulation theme. For any object of a certain kind, some maximal emulation exhibits specified symmetry. Now we want a context in which at least everything has maximal, some maximal emulation, and that's not always true. You, you need a decent context. It suffices to have that the union of emulations be an emulation, because then you can zornify, okay? Uh, zornify means uh, uh, is something that mathematicians uh, it means something to mathematicians. It's not uh, uh, you know as, as dirty as it sounds. Okay, <laughs> now it suffices to have the union of emulations be an emulation. This will happen if emulation is finitely based. And if you don't know what I mean by finitely based, uh, that's fine. Okay. Uh, all right. Looking a bit out in the future, there's a more general formulation. For certain natural partial orderings, partial orderings, in other words, this is, this is an improvement on this. this. In other words, if it's higher in the partial ordering, this is an improvement on this. Every point has a maximal successor exhibiting specified symmetry. This is in the future. I don't really have a, a case of this yet. Uh, for simple, a simple natural partial orderings, every point has a maximal successor exhibiting specified symmetry. For this, we generally want the partial orderings to be closed under soups. A lesson to be learned from emulation theory or the futures. Maybe everybody, no matter how ugly, can make maximal general improvement of themselves while also being beautiful in specific ways. So there, there could be a, a, you know, a, a kind of a cultural social implication to all this. All right? Now, emulation theory provides a particular context for this emulation theme, which is now a growing rich theory with plenty of open questions and thematic projects. By the way, that's a catchphrase, growing rich theory with plenty of open questions and thematic projects. That's meant to say it's real mathematics. That was the idea. All right. Some of these results demonstrably require using far more than the usual ZFC axioms. Emulation theory here lives in the, in the, in the rationals. Q01 is the closed unit interval in the rationals. And the objects of emulation theory are the subsets of, uh, of uh, the unit interval Q01 to the K, uh, the subsets of, those, of, the, of, the, of the set of vectors of length K, set of tuples from length K of Q01. So the, uh, the, the objects of emulation theory are infinite, countably infinite, and the number of objects is, of course, uncountable. Okay, we need to explain emulations and the symmetry. So we start with the symmetries. I'm going to delay explaining uh, uh, emulations until I explain symmetry. This is, symmetry has very deep roots in abstract set theory. Uh, we say that uh, a, a set of pairs is drop equivalent at x, y, and x prime y if and only if for all z less than y, x, z is an s if and only if x prime z is an s. And I call it drop equivalence because if I have, uh, here, the reason is the following picture. There is the picture. So I have two points, A and B, inside the uh, squares, Q0, 1. And I drop the points from A, I drop from A and B. I drop down to the baseline. I drop down to the baseline, uh, sort of like raindrops dropping down, right? I drop down, and, and, and uh, drop equivalence just means that, that as I go down both, on both, at both ways, but, you know, at the same horizontals, uh, I get equivalence as to whether they're in the set or not. So this is in the set if and only if. I get the same picture pattern, if you like, uh, on both lines. They, there's many ways to look at this. It, ju it just means a special symmetry here. Can you go back to the definition? So X, Y is capital A and X prime Y is capital B. They're, at, they're at the same, on the same horizontal. And then I, when I drop, I just change Y to Z. That's what dropping means. And then whenever I, wherever I am, I want uh, equivalence between whether you're in S on one side and whether you're in, on, in S on the other side. So it's really the simplest possible thing of, of, of roughly anything like this, right? Okay. So think of it as raindrops. The two raindrops are coming down, and they come down exactly this. 
they, they, membership in the in the ambient set is the same. You know, is, is the membership in the set is the same. All right. So um, uh, that's exactly what I said. Now, does every S exhibit some symmetry? Can I, given an S, can I always find an A and a B like that? Okay, so that uh, I have this symmetry. All right, that's the obvious one. Obvious question: Is this or is this special? How, how special is this to capital S? All right. And uh, there is an S. Unfortunately, there is an S. Uh, where drop equivalence holds only trivially. The only time you have drop equivalence is when x is equal to x prime, which makes drop equivalence trivial, or y equals 0, which makes drop equivalence uh, trivial, because you can't drop from 0 at all. Okay, so, uh, uh, so drop equivalence, uh, so this is very bad, right? But we can repair theorem 1 at some cost. We can repair theorem 1 at some cost, namely, Every S ha is drop equivalent at some x, y, x prime, y, non-trivially. If we replace q0, 1 by some other dense linear ordering uh, with endpoints 0 and 1, some other in, uh, uh, 1. Uh, and these replacements can be of any uncountable cardinality, but not countable. But not countable. OK? In other words, we can, in fact, uh, 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 fix this. We can't use Q01, but you have to use something more exotic. All right? So far, we're not threatening ZFC. However, now I want to go further. I want to get more radical. I want to know, I want, I want a drop equivalence that's stronger. I want XX and X prime X. I want XX and uh, X prime X. XX and X prime X. Notice, this is much more, much stronger. OK? Where x is less than, where 0 is less than x is less than x prime. This is a, a stronger one. And uh, I claim that I can also get this if I, uh, if I at, great, at a much greater cost. I have to replace q01 by some truly gigantic dense linear ordering with endpoints 0 and 1. And the size required here is far beyond anything that you can have in ZFC. Okay, this, is the, th this can be fixed, but only by something ridiculously big. All right? So the picture for this is that capital A is on the diagonal, right? In other words, capital A is, is of the form x comma x. All right. Don't get excited. This is an example of mathematical incompleteness that's closely related to uh, well developments in uh, known developments in large cardinal theory, and the literature already has plenty of mathematical incompleteness. Uh, but this is much simpler than the typical set theoretic independence result that you find. But I needed to make such simplifications in the set theory realm as a preliminary step to the main event. The main event is that, that this situation actually, if you, it, we're going to change it slightly. We're going to change it in a small way, and, and, we're, and this situation is actually going to appear in the rationals. Okay, right now, I just say that there's somewhere that this happens. But something like this happens in the rationals. Okay, and I'm going to I'm going to use some foreign things to do this, right? The uh, according to the article, according to the article, uh, large cardinals look like this, okay? <laughs> and they they look like this, and uh, uh, they're frightening. Uh, this is from Game of Thrones, and. Uh, 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 it says, now it must be true, right? It says understanding and describing higher infinities known as large cardinals have been kept separate from most modern mathematics. Friedman is working to make it large cardinals broadly relevant, engaging even pedestrian math mathematics with foundational questions. Okay, so this is, this is, and you can, it actually does remind me of a large cardinal. This, this actually does. It really does look like this. Now what's going to happen is all my colleagues who do large cardinal theory are going to take this off off of my website and use it whenever they talk about large crowds. I, I, I'm willing to bet that that's what they're going to do. Okay. Uh, the smallest large cardinal is what's called a, an inaccessible cardinal, or uh, uh, sometimes a strongly inaccessible cardinal. And to give you a flavor, and I'm not going to dwell on this too much, uh, it's a linear ordering. A linear ordering, that means that, right? A linear ordering uh, with a limit point. And every function from the power set of any proper initial segment uh, uh, stays within some proper initial segment. 
Okay, you can think about that. Uh, without one, you can use the positive integers, and without two, you can use the positive integers with infinity at the top. Now, suppose there are two inaccessible cardinals. Then I can show that there exists an inaccessible linear ordering that's independent of ZFC. And inaccessibles are very similar to what's called growth and deep universes in algebraic geometry. Now, what I use for what I use for uh, emulation theory is, in fact, far more ferocious. So, I'm, you know, th for every uh, 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 for every uh, scary beast, there's a bigger and more scary one, right? Okay. Um, and uh, uh, these these things are called one version of it. One version of these things are called subtle cardinals. You type in subtle cardinals in linear orderings, and out will pop uh, 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 something on the internet nicely. Uh, now, the prototype is for subsets of Q01 squared, some maximal emulation is drop equivalent at some xx, x, x prime x. Uh, so we don't use any old subset of Q01 squared. That we can't do. But we want to use a cousin. Okay? We want to use a cousin. So that's prototype one. But it, it actually gets to be simplified. So because everything is order theoretic, we have a better prototype. Prototype two is kind of better. Prototype 2 says, given a subset of Q01 squared, some maximal emulation is drop equivalent at 1, 1 half, a half, a half. These are my favorite numbers. 1 and 1 half, become my favorite numbers. 1, comma, 1 half, and 1 half, 1 half. You can, you can normalize this. Um, now, now, finally, I have to tell you what, a, what, a, what an emulation is. And uh, it's a very simple idea. Order equivalent. So let me tell you, what, what does it mean for two vectors to be order equivalent? That means they're in the same order. 3, 5, 1 is in the same order as 4, 6, 2. Right? 3, 5, 1 is in the same order as 4, 6, 2. That, that's an important equivalence relation on, called order equivalence. And a, and a one emulation just means they have the same elements up to order equivalence. Uh, so here is an exercise. Okay. Uh, uh, a first version of this is for all subsets of Q01 squared, some maximal one emulation is drop equivalent at one a half, a half, a half. It turns out that this is provable. This is not quite what we want, but we're getting very, very close to what I'm talking about. Uh, what we want to do is um, uh, uh, is do this uh, uh, for what's called an R emulation. So a one emulation just says that they have the same uh, uh, elements up to order equivalence. An R emulation means they have the same R tuples up to up to order two R tuples up to uh, order equivalence. So let's concentrate on the case of R equals two. If I have two sets of vectors, if I have two sets of vectors, what does it mean to be a two emulation? It means that the four tuples that I get by looking at pairs uh, are are the same up to order equivalence. Okay. So what I'm really talking about is the interactions between between the elements of the set. So two. So what really an emulation just means an, a, a, a two emulation means that that the interaction between pairs of elements are the same on both sides. That's all it means. Very simple idea. Uh, and and if uh, when and when we go to uh, Already in two dimensions, in order to prove this statement, you need uncountable sets to prove it. I'm pretty sure of that. But in three dimensions, I don't even have a proof uh, uh, in ZFC. So, for th so here's the statement in three dimensions. For all subsets of Q0, 1 cubed, some maximal R emulation is drop equivalent at 1 half, 1 half, a third, 1 half, 1 third, 1 third. Uh, this statement is probably independent of ZFC. I'm not quite sure. But the only proof I have uses much more than ZFC. Uh, what about the prototype statements from before? Well, some of them were not specific. You see, uh, uh, they didn't tell you what uh, what what meant, what the emulation meant. Okay. Uh, you see, this is a key definition: R emulation, namely the interactions. The idea behind R emulation is that ENS have the same R-fold interactions between elements from a strictly order theoretic point of view. So I'm just about ready to finish. Uh, 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 the official statement that I know is independent of ZFC 
says that if I have a subset of Q0, 1 to the K, some maximal R emulation is drop equivalent at 1 half through 1 over K, 1 half through 1 over K, 1 over K. Uh, so that statement is, is, is uh, equivalent to the consistency of a large cardinal. And uh, you might say, well, why these particular numbers? Well, the answer is I worked out all possible numbers you could use for this, and of course many more than these, uh, and I have a complete description of what numbers you can use. So th this is part of a general theory as to what you can use. Um, and uh, there's also work, which I don't have time to talk about, which, uh, t uh, remember, the, these statements uh, mention infinite sets. There's, there, are, there are versions of this that, uh, men that don't mention infinite sets at all, that are purely finitary. Okay, and I don't have time to talk about it. So you can have your cake and eat this. You can actually have the statements only talk about finite sets, but, uh, but the ones I presented do have an infinite, infinite sets in them. All right? And I think that I will, in fact, comment only that, uh, uh, that it appears that Matt has survived this talk. It hasn't been blown up. Thank you.